Well, see this delicious looking beef burrito here? Well, believe it or not, it's completely meat free. The plant based protein in this burrito is manufactured by Beyond Meat, a business recognized by Fast Company as one of 2014's most innovative companies. Ethan Brown, Beyond Meat's founder and CEO, believes that producing protein is the most important environmental question facing our society today and that replicating animal proteins with plants is part of the solution. A vegetarian since he was 18, Brown is the first to acknowledge that we humans are wired to crave and enjoy meat. So he set out to mimic the taste and texture of beef and chicken. Ethan, welcome to the show. Thank you this for This looks me. great. We're actually yeah. going to try some later, right? Well, yep. Uh, but listen, you grew up on a farm, right? The backstory is very interesting with you. So you were surrounded by animals, farm animals, all that. So how did a guy who grew up on a farm, probably eating meat, right. All of a sudden, go this way. Right, right. So actually, so I, I had a lot of exposure to a farm growing up, but I grew up in the city, and my, my dad had a hobby farm. Oh, okay. We, we would go to uh, on the weekends and summers, and it was supposed to be a place to just go and relax and recreate. But he ended up uh, creating a, um, a hundred Holstein cattle operation, and so we had dairy uh, cattle, and uh, you know, I, so I was exposed very early to to animal agriculture and the enormous amount of resources required to produce, in that case, milk from from cows. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the principle um, certainly translates to meat production as well. Uh, and so seeing that firsthand, I think it made an impression on me. Okay. But something must have something must have happened, though, at some point where you thought the connection to these animals and then you eating them sure. so is I think not for, right. For, for me, the observation was um, I always tried to look at uh, the animals that we kept in our home uh, and then the animals that were used uh, in the broader economy for food, and I could never tell the difference between one uh, versus the other yeah. in a way that was uh, significant enough to, to pamper one and, and slaughter the other. There is a cartoon that I love. It shows a, a dog and a cat talking to all these different uh, cattle and cows and chickens and saying, you know, they take care of us, we live with them, and they right. feed us, and they right. love us. Right. And all these animals are like, wow, that's amazing. Right. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that was yeah. the point for you. For right? sure, for sure. Yeah. That was the initial thing. And then if you start to take a step back and look at the food system we have, it really became, uh, I, I look at four different factors. And I looked at, um, you know, one being human health and heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and the, the relationship between those chronic diseases and, and disease, disease epidemics and, uh, and processed meat consumption. And then you look at um, uh, uh, resource use. And you look at the, for example, water here in California, the amount of water we use to, to create a, uh, uh, a hamburger, uh, as an example. Um, and they, people don't realize how much water it takes. It's not just the water that is fed to the cattle right, and the dairy cows. Right. It's the water that's used to grow the crops to feed. So I had a these an amusing moment along those lines. I was at a restaurant recently uh, where where we live, um, and uh, it, which is in Southern California, and uh, they, they were no longer serving water. They were saying you have to ask for it instead right. of being given to it, right? And then I opened up the menu and it was full of hamburgers and steak. <laughs> so I said, okay, right. people aren't focusing on the right thing. That's right, uh, that's right. Well, but you do admit, um, and this is often brought up, that we're built, our DNA is built to actually want meat, to right. eat meat. Right. So how do you go about changing someone's DNA if that's right. what they actually crave. So uh, the thing about meat is it's absolutely fascinating, our relationship to meat, right? It's it, the, the value that we, um, that we ascribe to meat is far greater than its nutritional value. And it's because it's so much part of our culture, it's part of our religions, it's part of our history and evolution. And so it's important to recognize that. And it's important, uh, you know, I don't think you're gonna build a great brand by saying, don't eat something you love. Yeah. It's much better to say, I'm gonna help you eat something you love, which in this case, we're saying, we're not telling you not to eat meat, we're saying we're going to create a piece of meat directly from plants. And from a science perspective, what's so fascinating about that, that's possible. You can actually do that. You can understand what the composition of meat is. And in our case, we look at it and we say, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a basic set of things. It's amino acids, it's lipids, it's carbohydrates, it's minerals, and it's water. And it's predominantly those amino acids and lipids and water, right? Okay. And so you can find all those in the plant kingdom. And you can understand the architecture of meat. They can put a, we put a chicken breast on an MRI. You can open up a textbook and understand how the fat is distributed, how the water is distributed, how the protein is distributed. So we can do all those things, and we can create this piece of meat directly from plants. If you were to go back to, to business school and say, I want to take a basic operations class, the first thing they would teach you in operations class is to remove the bottleneck from the production system. Yet if you look at our global food supply, we run an enormous amount of energy and resources through a really inefficient bottleneck, which is the animal. The animal is essentially at this point a bioreactor that creates meat from putting in plant matter and energy. We can do that better. 
and the history of technology and innovation is asking that question, how can I do this better? And we found a way at our company to do that. So let's talk about how you went about creating your Beyond Meat pr products. You said you, you actually looked at a chicken breast under an MRI to see the composition of it. Sure. So pretty much your product is composed in exactly the same way that meat is. It's just using the plant proteins rather than the meat. Yeah, and I think, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, that what we're trying to, so humans have been consuming meat um, uh, uh, for almost two million years, right? Uh, and, 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 and even longer, uh, certain species. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, this is a, uh, a long process. We're not going to get there overnight. Right. The products we have in the market today are very good, and they fooled a number of people. Mark Bittman, Alton Brown, et cetera, have, have all said these are great products. Yeah. Um, and but, these are well-known culinary experts. Yeah, exactly. You fooled, yeah. And it, so Whole Foods for, for three days in the Northeast uh, United States um, uh, mixed up our products in their prepared food section oh. and served chicken, actual animal chicken is our product, and our product is animal chicken in a chicken salad. Did they do that on purpose or it was they accidental? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. so it was, it was covered in the paper at the time. But I think the, the important thing is those were in dishes. And what we need to get to is the point where this product on a standalone basis is indistinguishable from its animal protein equivalent. Right. And that takes a lot of investment. We spent millions of dollars to create uh, new versions of each of our products. And those will be released you know, year after year to the point where we get it to, to where the consumer can say, okay, this is completely indistinguishable. I can use this in any dish that I would use animal protein in. Because, you know, the, the bad reputation that fake meat has right. had in the past is that it's, it tastes like fake meat. Correct. Right? It's rubbery or yep. the texture is weird. Yep. Right? So people were very turned off by it. So right. clearly you've tapped into what it takes to make it seem very, very authentic. I think what you have to recognize about meat is meat tastes great. You know, it's, it's satiating. What's the, okay, I ha full disclosure, full disclosure, everyone. I don't eat meat. Right. So this is actually a great segment for me <laughs> because I don't actually like meat. But it's interesting to, to you know, hear from you that people who love meat are right. being convinced of this as well. Well, I think there's something, and we talked about, um, you know, what are the factors that are driving it? And, and if you look at, you know, almost every day now, there's some new study that comes out that says that, that there's an association between meat consumption and, and a disease. Right. Or you look at the resource issues. We talked about climate change is one that's really fascinating right. to me. So I worked for a long time on fuel cells in, for a fuel cell company. I did business development for them. And if you, if you, uh, and, and we were spending, we spent a billion dollars developing fuel cells, right? Wow. Uh, if you put that amount of money into creating a piece of meat from plants, you'd have it almost, you know, tomorrow, right? Wow. And so I, I think um, you have to think about what's the, what's the total impact of your actions. And so uh, there was a study done in 2009 by uh, two scientists. They looked at all of the emissions associated with raising livestock uh, for, for protein and for food. And they found that 51% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to livestock. So that's more, 51%. Right, more than automotive, right? More than stationary power plants. So I said, well, what am I focusing on? Let me go focus on the right thing, right? And so and it, what's really cool about this is it's not, if you actually look at how those numbers are put together, one, of the, one major contributor is the fact that all animals are breathing. And when they breathe, they're emitting carbon. Right. 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 Yep. There used to be a huge carbon sink to absorb that in terms of um, forests. Those forests are being diminished. So you have this kind of e e disequilibrium. That's occurring. Yes. Yeah. So we're in the negative when it right. comes to that. Yep. Um, I know that you've had some interests from some pretty high pro pro profile people, yeah. one of them being Bill Gates. Yeah. Uh, but there's a funny story about the fact that he was a little bit hesitant in terms of yeah. the concept. He loved the concept of it. He didn't like the actual execution for himself. Right. right? So, so he, um, first, it's a blessing to have him involved. Yeah. And I think, you know, what, what he was drawn to um, is he was obviously someone who's disrupted a major industry and, and changed the way people um, uh, communicate. Uh, and, and he was very interested in, in disrupting the, the protein space uh, and providing particularly a low cost uh, protein solution for global hunger. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, you know, as we grow, we are very much looking at the uh, Chinese market, at the Indian market, uh, Africa, et cetera. Uh, today, we have to focus on the U.S. We have more demand here in the U.S. than we can actually supply, which is a great problem to have as a business. We just need to continue to invest in our facilities to do that. But, but Bill Gates has been a tremendous supporter, as have uh, many of our investors. Well, you mentioned um, the idea of helping in the global hunger issue, right. and uh, Bill Gates is a big proponent of that. Um, so with plant-based proteins, that's got to be a potential problem solver it when it comes to that issue, yeah. right? So if you think about, so if just taking the U.S. as an example, if you look at the uh, percentage of agricultural land that's dedicated to providing 
uh, crops for animal feed, for example, or direct grazing, it's 80% of our total agricultural land. Yeah. Imagine if you didn't need to do that. Yeah. So it all gets back again to this central observation that's an inefficient system we've set up, and isn't it time to disrupt that and create one that's more efficient? Yeah. So you, you also talked about the lower cost of right. plant-based protein. So that's got to help, again, in solving global hunger because yeah. low cost, and the nutrition value is equal, isn't it? Yeah, and so it's, and it's also a bit of a marathon. I mean, it's, it's so today, because of our scale, we can't offer things that are lower cost than meat. But there's no material obstacle to dramatically underpricing meat over time as we scale. Like, if you were to look at Tyson or Purdue and, and their facilities, we'd be a very, very small percentage of their total square footage, right? And yeah. we, just, we just don't have the scale. But as we grow and as more and more consumers say, you know what, tonight I'm going to have a plant-based version of meat versus an animal version of meat, uh, you'll start to see us just be able to, to, to have uh, more uh, aggressive pricing. What are the hurdles, though? I mean, is it is it still the perception? Is it still right. people wanting that big, fat, juicy steak? Right. And if it's not real, then right. forget about it. it, it th so that is, there, there are um, cultural uh, issues, for yeah. sure. Uh, and those are the ones that really fascinate me, is how do we get people to think about meat? You know, there's, there's really, there's these two ways to think about it. You can get hung up on meat has to come from a chicken, cow, or pig. Yeah. And if you do, then you have this ever-worsening set of problems. You have the climate, all these other things, right? But if you can think about meat in terms of meat, what's the composition of meat? then you're freed up to create that composition from many different sources, right? And so that's, that's what we're doing. We have to get the consumer to understand that it's just as satiating. It's better for them, right? It's a cleaner source of protein. We, wouldn't put, we, we, we couldn't create cholesterol if we wanted to, and we wouldn't put it in there anyway, right? So if you're going to redesign meat, why not take some of the things that are maybe bad for people out of it, right, and offer something that's better? Well, listen, we have some of the products here, so we've got to taste it. Um, the, I mentioned the beef burrito here, and then this is a chicken salad it is, sandwich, yeah, right? Yeah. And this is much like the one where there was that confusion over, over uh, animal protein versus plant. Because here's the thing, it actually even looks right. like chicken, right? Yeah, and, and, and what, what we've done what, so much work on there is creating that, uh, that, that texture that is much like a muscle texture. Right. And so you, what you're doing is you're taking a set of protein from plants and you're just reorganizing them so they bind together, they stitch together a lot like protein would in muscle. And that's what gives that impact on your teeth. Right. Well, I've got to say, this tastes totally like chicken. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm not going to eat the beef burrito, but, <laughs> but I believe, I'm I'll sure take it it's... <laughs> take it with you. We'll give you a doggy bag. Thank you. But it's delicious. Well, Ethan, I think it's amazing what you guys are doing. Well, thank um, you. And it really will make a global difference. That's and people need for. to catch on to this concept. That's what it's we're hoping brilliant. for. brilliant. And every year, we're going to be producing products that are better and better. I mean, that's the thing about our company. We have a firm belief that uh, over time, we will get it exactly right. And each year, I think the consumer has enough trust in what we're doing. Each year, we release new products that get closer and closer. Right. Well, yep. judging from this, you're pretty dang close already. Thank so. you very much. Ethan, thank you so much. No, it's Good a luck great to pleasure. You. Thank you. All right. Coming up next, could you survive solely on food that was either discarded or given to you by others? We meet one woman who did just that. We'll be right back.